And we are live with Toolman Tim, John Willis, Nicole Sauce today. How's everybody doing? Um, just drop in a hello to us in the chat and we'll say hello back. Uh, Toolman Tim is somebody I've talked to a lot on, on my podcast and he's on the expert council for the survival podcast. And when he said he'd be able to take time out of his Florida vacation to join us today, <laughs> I thought, why not? So Tim, tell us a little bit about who you are. Sure. Well, Normally, I'm coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, but right now we're uh, we've been a week in at Daytona Beach. We're leaving tonight to come and see some of my imaginary internet friends up in Tennessee, which is going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I run a, a handyman business up there called All Seasons Maintenance. I run the workshop YouTube channel slash podcast, which is preparedness, uh, repairedness, which is you know the art of home maintenance when help isn't around the corner. And I just, you know, I live to see other people successful in entrepreneurship. So that, that's who I am. You can look me up, uh, the workshop or Toolman Tim on YouTube or anywhere, and I'm there. Yep. And the link to his YouTube is in, or no, to his website is in the uh, description today if anybody's like wondering how to find him. Um, also, come and take it. That's all I got to love say. It. Come and take it. <laughs> <laughs> Best shirt ever. John, what's going on in SOE land? Uh, normal, normal, everything, just, just normal, everything right now. Normal, okay. everything. Which that, everything. I think that's, more? that's the big thing, right? People watch videos and stuff. And, and if you look at the, if you follow me around for a day or let's say every day for a week, it's all exactly the exact same stuff. <laughs> and there's 1% variation in that because that's, that's what having animals, right? Animals don't care if it's raining. They don't care if it's <laughs> snowing. They don't care if it's hot or cold you still have to do the exact same thing. You might change the time slightly, but that, that's just it. Every, like there's not a, a special magic pill. It's just doing the exact same thing that works over and over and over. Yeah, a lot that's of people don't realize that about working for yourself is you're still working. Yeah, yeah. And you just don't have a boss breathing down your neck saying, you know, you've got to be your own motivator, right? And I talk about that being your own superpower, like doing doing the right thing every day and it's fun for a while but eventually it becomes the routine and if you can't stick with it you can be in trouble yeah most yeah. most not good employees they don't become good self-employees they don't like that just doesn't typically happen some dudes are like i've had enough i'm gonna go and they have no choice you know because if they they have no choice but to make it work but most people that leave because they're constantly in trouble at work, it, they don't have, it doesn't just work on the other side. Yeah. 100%, 100%. It's, I think that is one of the big demons you need to slay is when, when you're starting to work for yourself and it's possible and easy to just sleep in that extra hour or whatever, like the beautiful part of self-employment is if I decide I want to do my errands at 10 o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning when the stores are lighter, I can do that. What that means though, is I then need to work later that night or I need to get up early and work because if I don't do the work, the money doesn't come in. That's and right. I think that one, when people first do the transition, it's hard. And the second thing is when people find out you work from your home, they think you're huh. just there doing nothing. And so they want to stop by at any time <laughs> with the expectation that you can drop everything. And that's been a hard one for me over the years to kind of get the standard because I tend to work during what would be traditional working hours. I may start early, I may go late, but pretty much when I'm here and I'm working, it's a hundred percent focused on getting that done as fast as I can. So I can go do something else. Cause I find if I focus, I get a whole bunch done. If I try to multitask, it's a bad idea. And if you come in and interrupt me about whatever, it, it like totally screws my up my timing for the day. So, yeah. I don't handle interruptions very well. I Going back a little bit about you talking about slaying, having to slay that. For me, I, I mean, I yeah, I've, I've developed the ability to, to do it day in and day out, but I, I still have to slay that dragon every so often. It always wants to creep back up on me. I know some people just excel at keeping it there, but I got to reach around and friggin' stab that thing in the neck every so often because that's just my my nature, you know, and if I don't, I can slide myself right back into that old employee mindset where eh, there ain't nobody looking at me and I can just do what I want. But yeah, that, that's part of it. it you know, you, 
but you got to make that choice, right? Get the old sword out and fight the dragon every so often because that's just what happens. Yeah, I think that's I think that's why it's important to have you know things that you're after. People like you know money's not everything <laughs> or objects aren't everything. But when you have something in mind that you are chasing, you will perform a whole lot better than just being like, A1. oh, I want it. You have to you have to name that, right? I want to make ten thousand dollars this week. I want to make ten thousand dollars this month. I'm you know whatever it is. I, I operate way better when I just go buy that thing that I should not buy because I have no choice <laughs> but to make things work. When the building's on fire, like there are multiple times every year where my bank account is literally at zero. And I, those are when you see me perform and we have new products coming out and we're a lot more social media posts. It's because I did something that I, that was dumb. I know, but that's when I'm going, because I'm never going to fail. I work better on the negative than I do on the positive. Yep. That's the, there's that whole mindset behind um, a lot of times people get shit done better when they have a short deadline. Like Absolutely. if you give somebody three weeks to do it, they're going to leave it. Well, not everybody. I hate to lump everybody in the same damn thing, but you, most people are going to leave it for them last 48 hours and then get the job done. And they're going to do just as damn a good job now. And, you know, with a two day deadline than they would with a 14 or 21 day deadline. Yeah. You give me a million dollar contract with a year to perform. We're not going to touch that thing till 90 days out. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, and well, I've been learning act. I've been unlearning that habit. So I've been learning to artificially put pressure on myself to perform ahead because I have a tendency to overcommit to speaking engagements. <laughs> and one of two things happens if I don't like have a fake deadline to be ready for one or another, either I'm writing my notes the night before and the speech is still good. Or if I've done it or I'm like making it up on the fly and the quality output, I learned this last year because in the fall I had speak engagement after speaking engagement. The quality output is better if I've, if I've put thought to it several weeks in advance and have that structure, even though I'm not going off notes at the speaking engagement. Um, and in order to do that, I literally have to trick myself into thinking it's, it's due, you know, <laughs> a different time or it's the same thing. I, I don't, I've always been that way. I don't, I'm a procrastinator by nature. And when you know that, you can actually tap into your procrastination to perform really well. You just have to figure out how to dial it up. Yeah, I've, I've been a procrastinator. I was born a procrastinator. It's in my genes, so it's always a fight. But for, for LFTN, sometimes what I find works good for me is, like I outlined my presentation two months ago. I put it on paper and I didn't touch it for six weeks after that. Yep. Because then it's just kind of beating around up in my head. And it does that background work. I don't even know what you want to call it, but it's always just there. And then when I get a little idea, I might jot it down. And then those last two weeks, I kind of go balls to the wall and, and finish it up. But it gives me something to get started for sure. Okay, Tim. So how much money did you start have in your pocket when you started your handyman business? <laughs> uh, less than I tell other, other people that should have it uh, for sure. Um, you know, we... I, this, this is a big, uh, every, you know, a part of what I'm going to talk about on Thursday, but I had the misfortune or, of making some choices in my working life that really burnt me out to the point where I was suffering physically. And I was always a damn good worker. You know, I was always top salesperson wherever I worked. And I'd always take on way more responsibility than I should simply because to me, that was my definition of success. So what would end up happening was I would get burnt out working, right? So uh, when I finally, when I finally, I, I pointed at five years ago in a week or so is when I launched my business. And when I finally launched it successfully, I left working for the man with maybe a couple of weeks worth of money saved up. So not a lot, you know, <laughs> I tell people, ideally, you should probably have three months worth of bills saved up before you're ready to leave and do your thing. But again, uh, I always say, you know, abject poverty is a really good motivator. And so I, uh, I was just burnt out. I walked away. I had been building that business quite a bit. So, you know, I probably had half of the income coming in that I was getting working somewhere else. So yeah, I, I, that's one of those do as I say, not as I do kind of scenarios, because in multiple occasions in the past, I've jumped into things sooner than I would tell other people to do it. You know, 
a lot of people I've seen who start something that have a year or two in the bank are less successful than those who have nothing. I know John started his current thing with nothing <laughs> and has done remarkably well. I jumped for the same reason you did. I was giving myself a heart condition and I yep. was not ready. I'm wondering if we're giving people the wrong advice. I mean, I it is nice to have expenses saved up in the bank, but that pressure that we were talking about earlier is there when you're like, well, if I don't sell all the coffee, I don't pay the bills, so I better sell the coffee. It makes you a lot more motivated to make that phone call to find out if you can sell it. Yeah, you're, you're not lying there for sure. I, I'm just... I, maybe I'm a little nervous. I, I make this joke a lot, but I, I never really want to have somebody's wife or husband message me and say, why the hell did you tell him to quit his job? You know, I'm like, right. But you're right. I mean, there is a real motivator when you, like I said, abject poverty is a good motivator. And if you're, if you're basically living hand to mouth on your business, you're going to do absolutely everything you can to find mm -hmm. success. Whereas like you said, if you've got six to 12 months worth of money in your account, you might be more apt to, Know, take it a little easy and not and not do that, you know, because those first couple of years, especially in business, are those are those make or break years where you really need to do everything you can to get it going. And you're on year five now, so you've made it over the the four year hump. Yes, yeah, we it yeah, and that there really is a point. Like about a year ago, I finally got to that point. And again, you got to be careful because I got to the point where I had enough contracts now that I didn't have to be as hungry to go find new work. And that can be a little dangerous because then all of a sudden you get a little complacent. And I've seen it for sure this last winter, especially it was like, Oh yeah, well, do I really need that? You know? And so you get, yeah. But then I always think quite often, like, you know, a majority of my business is tied up in four, four vendors. So if I lose one, that's 25% of my income, which is about as much as I'm comfortable with. I wouldn't want to be tied up because in my area, uh, in the oil patch, a big thing, entrepreneurship was huge there. Everybody had their own business when I first moved there. But the thing was, everybody was building a business around one client. So, you know, this guy that was a well servicer, he had one buddy who spoon fed him all the work for a single company. And when that company went belly up, so did that, uh, you know, um, business that the guy had built around it as well. And I, I, I've tried hard to keep diversity in there because that really does scare me losing you know you end up losing one customer like you said that's 25 percent of your income there yeah and if you're dependent on that 25 percent, you're screwed you yes so, yeah make sure you make sure you're not you're not dependent on just that right like i i want to bring on another full-time employee because our idea is you know we're we never stop building businesses but we want more flexibility in our lifestyle and some businesses are more of a a local tie a location tie than others so I need to build it to the point where I have probably two really, really good employees that I can count on that we could leave and travel the countryside for a month and still do all the content creation. You know, we're doing the Canadian coffee company thing, all that kind of stuff we can still do while having someone that I can trust that can go at midnight and look at a leaky faucet or the other night it was like 1030 at night and somebody said the light was flashing in the hallway, that kind of stuff. Oh, the infamous flashing light. I had one in my room here where I record. Last mm -hmm. time I did a, a live stream with John Willis, I had to get up and turn this light off. And I was like, what the hell? So I pulled it all apart, figured it had backed out, right? Nope, it was an LED bulb. And it had just, that's how it went bad. <laughs> it went into blink mode. So I was very disappointed. That thing was supposed to last me eight or nine years, right? It lasted two. <laughs> Typical. They don't make them like they used to, right, John Willis? They really, they really do not make anything like they used to. Absolutely. Yeah. I say that literally every day as we're fixing something broken. So I have an event. It starts tomorrow. Oh, yeah. And for this event, I have these really cool convertible freezer fridges. So it can be an upright freezer or an upright fridge. And I, I took one and put it in fridge mode three days ago. I've had it for one month. 37 oh. days it broke yeah and all of Lowe's, your Lowe's took it back outside their parameter of 30 days because we go there so much for rental properties and stuff but 
that happened, and then my smoker, which is also being used at this event, yesterday broke. So we oh. called it the day of everything breaks. What broke on the smoker? Um, I was able to fix it. The controller stopped working, so it wouldn't turn on. Yep. And I, I got a refund and ordered a new one to come out because it was going to arrive by Thursday. And then I got on YouTube and just started looking for how do I bypass this controller? Because it's like a giant oven. That's what I really need it to do. That's how we're making bacon. And, you know, we can make bacon other ways, but I found a video about a guy who bypassed it. He took the controller off and put the two things together, but mine only had one coming out. So my model is newer. And when I took that controller out, water started pouring out of the controller box and oh. where the cable comes through the smoker all of the steam and smoke that oozes that's not coming out the stack thing comes out there so it's a flaw in the design and then there's condensation the controller was full of water i dried it off put it back together i call it the horrible hole of humidity where it shall never be mounted over the top of ever again it totally works now so I, was, I actually fixed it. I went outside and screamed, I'm invincible, and pumped, fist pumped, and tactical thought I was crazy. So the, it's such a common thing for those boards to fail. You can buy them on Amazon. They're 35 to 55 bucks. Yeah. We keep a brand new one because we use our smoker several times a week. And then this other thing that happens is if you leave the pellets in the auger and you don't get them out, yeah. the humidity will build up and they turn to uh, blue. And you yeah. literally have to, we have to hammer it's, it's almost impossible. So we have a second auger also propped up right in the corner by the kitchen door. So if that thing goes down, we can have them back running in about 15 minutes. But yeah. if, if you don't cover that, like they are not made to be left outside like a barbecue grill. Oh, no, no. My, my, the humidity was coming from inside. It was leaking up in there. And so I'm just going to mount it off to the side so that that can't happen. And then the connections were all rusty after one month. Yeah, put it in like a Rubbermaid container or something like you, something like you do the uh, charge controller for an electric fence. You know? Yeah, that's a great idea. But um, that said, I now have a free smoker because my money was refunded. And I canceled nice. the second one coming. So I was like, well, I repaired it. So there we go. I should probably feel duty bound to give them the money back, right? No. No. I wrote, a, I wrote an email to the company and said, have you figured out a workaround for this design flaw? <laughs> So we'll see if they answer. Yeah, if you get on get on Amazon and start reading reviews, you'll see a bunch of stuff, guys talking about that. But I find that anytime we have a problem with something, we just type it into YouTube and there's a yeah. hundred other people that have had the same issue. Yeah. I gotta so. say too, I well, I love the idea, John, of keeping extra parts on hand. <laughs> Not many people do that, but Amazon and eBay, it's unreal for parts. Uh, I yeah, just find your manual, find your part number. And just throw that quite often i have better luck throwing it into google and adding the name the word amazon or ebay because i find google has a better search than those two but man you can almost always find aftermarket parts for just about anything for way cheaper using way cheaper Am yeah and they're the, you know they come into the same damn factory yeah and they're just yeah they're just not marked up going through the whole supply chain it's i've i've saved myself tons doing that and when you start reading the the reviews and stuff you'll see people say like Oh, this is made by this other company, so you can find the other part number for it, or you can yeah. go get it local. Like we have a cobalt chainsaw. It turns out that the they're made by Groundwork or something, or another another Greenwork or something. So oh you, yeah, you couldn't find a bar to save your life, and Lowe's Lowe's policy uh, is just replace, right? Well, if right. they stop carrying it, so they can't replace it. So all you get is a refund. So online, we found we were able to buy three bars for you know a hundred bucks, so now we've got bars for this thing. Oh, that's cool. It's, it's interesting. Harvest writes that way with the vacuum pumps. You can buy your vacuum pump from them, or you can just buy a vacuum pump for less. A lot less. A lot a less. A lot less. Like, retired at 40, has an oilless pump. I think he said he got it off eBay, 350 bucks. What are we paying for those, 1,500-ish? Yeah, 12 or 15. Yeah. 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 And, and he, that much? he says that they're good to go. Like, I'm going to buy two of them just to have. We haven't even had a problem with an oilless pump. Right. That's, the I have... Thing is I have the oil pump, but same thing. I just upgraded my oil pump. Yeah. If you can buy an aftermarket one, if you can get two of them for 300 a piece, so that's 600 bucks, or you can buy one, you know, for well over a thousand and they each last, last half as long, you're still money in the bank. 
big it, time. It's the same argument. You know, we can get it. I got a, I just a year or two ago, we bought a brand new Honda EU 7500, right? Yep. 4500 bucks. I think we paid for it. I'll bet it's close to six grand today. But you can buy what, what Spearco say. We can buy those champion yeah. or those predators from, uh, from, um, Harbor Freight. Harbor Freight. And, and for the price, I can buy six of them. Yes. And, and even, and like at that point, you don't, you don't even have to change the oil on the damn thing. So you just <laughs> let them dead, pull another one out of a box. While we're on that topic, a lot of people have no idea when you buy these, they don't come with oil. If you yeah. have an auger for your tractor and you get it home, it has no oil in it. A lot of these compressors, a lot of the um, um, generators have no oil in them at all. Now, when you buy them from Honda, a dealership, they've taken them out at the dealership. They've put oil in them. They've test fired them. Everything's good to go. But be aware of that. When you buy these things and it doesn't say on the box, hey, this motherfucker has no oil. In it. So <laughs> open that up when you get home, check it out and have that ready to go. Right. Yeah. So what you're, what don't you're turn saying, it on without the oil. <laughs> Bad you're idea. saying you should actually look at your dipstick before you start something up for the first time? That's right. a novel well, concept. I, I, it's, it's baffling that they don't say there's not a thing on there on the fuel tank, like a tag that says, hey, there's no oil in this thing. I like, I've been using Furman for quite a while. I got a tri fuel Furman generator. You can get them at Costco. Okay. And that thing is fucking incredible. It was less than a grand, and it'll run on gas, propane, and natural gas. Comes with a wheel kit, comes with a cover. And uh, came with a well, of course, oil and uh, a funnel, which blew me away. Just it was literally, oh, it even come with two wrenches to put the wheels on. Like How big is it? Was, yeah, um, it's a good size. It's an open frame style. I mean, what's uh, the what's the output? Oh, sorry, ninety uh, max is out at ninety two hundred. Run, oh, running one. is seventy five, and uh, but then if you go down to your natural gas and your um, propane, you lose about a third of that. So gasoline's yeah. the highest. But I got a ton of videos on my channel. And I've run my whole house short of my central air off of it. And wow. I'm going to get a, a slow start or a soft start for my central air unit. And I should be able to run everything off it. Awesome. Yeah, it's an awesome generator. But I went through, I've never been to Harbor Freight until this week in my entire life. Because we don't have them. And honestly, we've got a store in Canada called Princess Auto that's like dead fucking similar. Except for the generators. I was looking at them and I said to Becky, I'm like, how can I get this? I want... <laughs> I want to buy those the little EU 1000 and 2000 knockoffs. Love them. I, if I could, <laughs> by the time I shipped them back to myself, it wouldn't be worth it, right? But well, the question the is price, who's driving yeah. over the border? Well, we will be. We're, we've already decided we're going to take a trip down to Montana and Dakota. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to bring two or three of them back with me just because I, well, it's content for my channel. Plus, I have a generator addiction. So, yeah. Yeah. It's easy to get that addiction. I actually need to fire mine up because it's been a little while. Yes, you um, do. <laughs> they they run super quiet. Those Hondas, like in the eco mode. Yeah. You, you, so you can run them at night. Nobody hears it. You can charge batteries and stuff on it. You can kick them up, and they'll have power. I mean, we ran we ran a chest freezer. We went back and forth between a, a fridge freezer and a chest freezer. I want to say on a one thousand. I want to say it was on the little one, and it just sips fuel on that eco mode, and it's sine wave, so you can plug any of your sensitive electronics into it. And it doesn't fry them like people people buy these big generators and they're like, I'm going to use this when there's when there's trash that lives around you that doesn't have a generator. As it gets longer, they get more desperate. And that generator, you might have a you might as well have some some floodlights up in the air because it is so loud. You can hear it blocks away when you run like those big open frame. Generators. Yeah. And there are a way to quiet them up. You can put them in a building. You can double wall it. You can pipe the exhaust down through a pipe and back up. I mean, there's you, there's a ton of ways to quiet generators down, but you're not going to do it with the day you take it out of the box and need that thing because the power just went off. Well, hopefully you're not taking it out of the box for the first time when your power goes off. Right. Well, hopefully you know the true. oils in there also. But. <laughs> actually, uh, can, somebody can, has said, oh, I bought a new generator, but it actually had a tag on the electric start button warning you that you needed to put oil in it before starting. As that the should be. Has those. <laughs> As yes. that should be. <laughs> yeah. The ferment has those. They they have a, you know, sometimes when I start putting things together, the first thing I do is I take all the paper and stickers off everything and I get all my parts out and unloaded. But if I get rip roaring and tearing, sometimes I don't look at those tags. And yeah, the ferment, they come, you actually have to, in order to remove it, you have to take the uh, dipstick out 
and take that off and it says you need to add oil to this. So I do the same thing, except I light them on fire so I can never look at the instructions. Not really. But I mean, that's, <laughs> I what, that's what guys do, right? We don't, yeah. we don't need any of that. I'm trying to think. I, I, I read the instructions on something recently. Because I did the same thing, but there was something I really didn't want to break. And I was like, I better read it, but I can't remember what it was. I like when it comes with a, a plastic laminated, you know, quick start guide. Yeah. What you need Herman is has right one there. of those too. It's, it's pretty waterproof, pretty durable. We're going to keep it with the piece of equipment. Yeah, that makes sense. I just installed a garage door and a garage door opener for the first time in my life. Never done them before. I, I went to YouTube University first. And then I followed the instructions in the book a little bit, but I find you, you know, the instructions are okay, but you learn all those quick tips to save yourself hours of swearing and frustration by spending 15 minutes watching some other dude do it on YouTube. Have you seen that all your garage door sets are up? They've literally increased a hundred percent. Yes. So I, here, here's the reason I did it myself because I, I made it one of those projects where I wasn't going to pay anything for it. I need Whatever I spent on it was going to come from extra from a business. So like um, scrap copper or uh, things I got from bank repos that I do. I turn around and resell them on Marketplace, you know. So I priced last year through a local company. It installed. It was a grand. This year, it was two grand installed. So I went and bought for, I, I bought a, a decent door from Home Depot and an opener for $1,100. And I installed it myself, learned a new skill and saved a grand, basically. He's made a whole living doing that. <laughs> like, I know I'll offer snow clearing services and I'll pick up dog poop when the snow melts. And that's how I'm going to start my business. Yep. And then people say, well, can you do this? Can you do that? And I think my favorite one you did, somebody had a gi ginormous wasp nest Oh. and they needed yeah. wasps removed and nobody wants to, nobody wants any part of that. Right. How and do you, you, you kill them or remove them. Both. <laughs> Both. Um, yeah, go ahead, Nicole. You can. Well, yeah, it I was like just your... funny because he goes online. He's like, anybody ever done this before? Yeah. And everybody gave him advice. And then what did you end up doing finally? What was your yeah. approach? Yeah. So it was like I went into the TSP uh, Facebook forum back when we were still, you know, when it's still a, a going concern there. And we did this. I kind of call it like a group thing where we all, everybody give me different ideas. What I ended up settling on was I took my shop vac, I put an inch of water and uh, dish soap down in it. Then I took a 12 foot length of ABS pipe and attached it to the end of my shop back with clamps. So I can stand back about 16 feet, suck the hell out of that, uh, the wasp's nest. And I usually have a, a buddy with me that has, you know, the long spray uh, insecticide or whatever as well. So we do it both. We go in the evening when they're there, just put sweaters on and shit. And I can suck the whole thing down and I knock on wood, never a single sting since I've done it. And I can get up into the peaks without needing to be on the ladder while I'm doing it. And are you, a, are, you yeah. a, are you a Milwaukee guy? I'm a DeWalt guy. Okay. Uh, I would love to get into Milwaukee a bit too, but I'm a, I'm a big proponent of a single platform. I, you know? I, me too. Me too. But I have, I have both now because we're switching to red. Um, but Milwaukee, the reason I say it, Milwaukee makes an 18 volt as well as a 12 portable shop vac. And it's got three. I, so from right here, I can vacuum the floor and we run them probably about an hour total. It's one of those, you know, you get this tool and you use it and you're like, yeah, it's 75% of the way. And ever, every so often you find a tool and you're like, this is a hundred percent exactly. And that's the, that's this Milwaukee shop back. I want oh, that thing. I, I suck up bugs and I'm a, I'm a weirdo. I have a bunch of oddities and shit. So I keep jars full of different kinds of dead bugs. And we suck up wasps when they get in the shop. We suck up stink bugs and we just have them inside this thing and it works perfect. Pantry moths, we suck those things up. Uh, Japanese beetles and squash bugs, I vacuumed them up with a little shop, bus, a little like dust buster last year, uh, this yep. rechargeable. This year we're gonna use that and we can pull them right off. So when you get close and as soon as you bump a branch, Nicole, you know those Japanese beetles yeah. scatter? Not with this thing. You can you can literally suck them all up. You can fill that whole container full of them, and then take them and just you know drown them. Put them in well, water. I was I was impressed with whatever that was you pulled out when there was the stink bug invasion from my chairs. That's it. That's it. Yeah, I need to get one of those here because I keep coming into situations where I'm like, I still haven't bought that. Why haven't I bought that? I need Man, to ask John what that is. That tool, and I bought a Dewalt um, hog ring pliers. 
I watched your video on that. Holy cow, man. That I thing, can tell you're excited. It loads like a stapler. That is one of, it's like one of the few tools that worked exactly like I wanted it to. I'm that way with the DeWalt inflator. If you've never used one of them yet, those are fucking incredible. That okay. thing is every bit as good. Like I, I actually don't own a compressor anymore because I bought the, all I ever used it for was airing up tires and um, brad nailing. So I bought the cordless brad nailer that runs without any, yep. uh, and I love that thing's friggin' awesome. It's expensive, but it's awesome. It's awesome. So that little 20 volt inflator is built perfect. Like everything about it, I say an engineer, you know what engineers are like, but whoever did it, they put some real world thought into it and it'll, it'll inflate my truck tires faster than my old compressor would. And it's so just a little, yeah. We had a dude with a, a 450, F450 steel rim. Trisha's yep. at the restaurant with him, Nicole, calls me middle of the night. She's like, hey, can you, can you bring a, uh, a sledgehammer, a compressor, and I don't remember what else she wanted, right? So we, we go out there. They no questions this, asked. You just showed up with all that stuff, right? <laughs> hot hole, and he took this thing, and I've got video of it, man. He's swinging this sledgehammer to hit this steel wheel that had had a big flat spot in it, and I'm waiting for the hammer to go through the truck right next to him. I'm just waiting for it to come through the door. But he beat this thing, hit it about 16 times, got it in line, and he used that same inflator you're talking about. He had a DeWalt on board. His batteries were dead, so luckily I had some more. We popped them in there, and he got this thing. We were able to just kind of lift it up enough that he could hit the rim, and then we were able to seat it enough that it kind of mushroomed out, and we were yes. able to inflate it off of this. Have you ever used the ratchet strap trick for seating a tire? Yes. I, my, my, yeah. So my brother-in-law, I, I called him a couple of years ago. I was out in the middle of a great big field with my zero turn mower and I ran over some nasty stuff and I didn't have my uh, plug kit and it really probably wouldn't have worked anyway because it's kind of a nasty gash, but I had some of that slime stuff and it yep. worked. I hate it, but it worked. And I said, what do I do? He says, get a ratchet strap, run it around the center of the tire. So it sucks it in, push it. Well, anyway, it worked great. So yeah, yeah. Was, if anybody's ever want to try it, check it out. Just put a ratchet strap around and it'll help seat your tire. I've had holes big enough I can put my thumb in them, right? So we just put as many plugs in it as we can get. And then with the green slime, oh, and then we'll, yeah. like, we've, ridden, we've literally ridden like in the sidewall of an XR650 out in, out in, uh, out by Vegas. Everything's, you know, volcanic rock. So it just cuts shit. We rode the rest of the weekend on that thing like that. I believe it. Yeah. Cause I, I just drove a tire through my, my everyday driver. I got a Ram 1500. And I went, there are these cheap Goodyear tires, and they put a, a rock right up between the treads. And it was about yay wide. So when I seen it, I said, fuck, I ain't even plugging it on the side of the road. I, I put my wheelbarrow tire on and finished my inspections that day. But I took it home and decided to try to plug it before I went to the shop just to see if I could, you know. And I put like six plugs in it, and it was very, very close, but it didn't quite. So I bet you if I'd have used some of that slime with it, it would have, just for the hell of it if I was ever in a pinch. So somebody's saying dead Japanese beetles are a treat for their chickens. We give them to our chickens. They won't touch them. They won't touch those. They won't touch squash bugs either. Like will not have anything. They kind of run up, do that side eye thing they do, and then that's it. Well, wait. Who's this handsome fellow who just joined the feed? Hey, I'm I'm John. How are you? What's up? We have the Johns today. All right, hey, double John. Bush. Can never have too many Johns in this world. John Bush, welcome to the show, my my former Unloose the Goose friend. What's up in your world? Tell us about who you are. And Well, my name is John Bush. I hail from Bastrop County, Texas, and I am a advocate for freedom and individual sovereignty and living the good life. Got to throw that in there because everyone gets all serious about this freedom stuff, and I think they forget to have fun. So I know you guys <laughs> don't have that problem here. Nope. Amen to that. I'm invincible this week, so you know. The ice cream truck's driving by. If anybody can hear a weird, I was wondering what that was. <laughs> yeah, I was just like child playing with a toy. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> hey, we got a question here. Um, any good portable generator you would recommend? Cost, quanti quality, best option. You want to go ahead, John? Man, I got I got probably eight Hondas over here. I've got some clones from Costco. I don't know the name of them. They're basically copies. The patents ran out on all the Honda stuff years ago. So you see everybody, Generac's got their, their just buy something. That, if you're buying a small generator, buy something that has sine wave, right? It says it's electronics for sensitive electronic safe. 
you'll be happy. All those things, they, they run half mode, so they're eco mode. They run quiet at night. You can bump them up during the day. You, you, pay, for, people... you pay for the Sorry. brand name of Honda, but I always feel like if I buy it, I don't ever have to worry about it. I think a lot of people overestimate how much they're, I mean, not everybody, you know, a lot of people overestimate how much they're actually going to use their generator. Uh, you know, if, if you're a camper or you're going to run an ice cream truck with it, well, that's great. But, you know, most people, if you're going to use it for three or four power outages a year, you know, you might put maybe 20 hours of runtime in a year tops, right? I, I play with mine all the time. And I think I put eight hours of runtime in it last year. That was it, right? And so I didn't even come close to, changing the oil on it so for the average joe like i mean of course I'm, I'm not an american so i don't get to go to harbor freight very often but everybody recommends those predators they're great and Furman, i i love the Furman stuff that's the the cheaper one you get at costco and they've got some of the suitcase style eu 1000 2000 knockoffs as well and I, there's really it almost seems like there's three levels of generator companies you get your generax or up top and uh honda and then you come down to like Furman, westinghouse Predator, Champion, and then you go down below that, and they're those absolute Chinese knockoffs that every store has some weird brand you've never heard of. And I like staying in the middle for value, but yeah, you can't go wrong. John, what are your thoughts on generators? You have a power wall, don't you? Oh, yeah, so I have a um, 4,000 watt generator. I don't even know what the brand is. It's old school. I inherited it from my uncle when he passed away. We haven't fired it up to test it, but I definitely, definitely need to. But yeah, we have a solar system on our home. It's 11.2 kilowatts. And we bought three Tesla power walls that'll store collectively just under uh, 40 kilowatt hours of electricity. So it's super great. And when, the, when there's good sun out and, and good conditions, the system will, will bring it, will do like 70 kilowatts uh, of, of energy, kilowatt hours, which is pretty sweet. So we're really happy with that. It runs our guest house as well. Yeah. Power wall is twenty four thousand a piece. Am I am I somewhere in there on that? Uh, I think it was a little bit less. I don't know if it's because we bought three. I mean, we financed the whole deal. Uh, if anyone can find good solar financing, from what I understand, most of the companies that finance them, the interest rates are pretty pretty high. So that's up on our list of things to chunk down as quick as possible, so we don't. Because like when you look at it over the life, if you pay it over the whole term you end up almost paying as much in interest as the cost of the actual product, which is- so It's like buying yeah, a house on a 30 year mortgage. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly like that. And yeah. a lot of them, you're, I'm, at least I'm seeing a ton of targeted marketing to uh, why don't people have solar? Cause they don't know it's free, you know, all this stuff. And they get you in these, it's almost like a, they get you in this contract. And, and even when you sell the house, you still pay that, that, that amount on it. There's a lot of like yeah. shady shit around the solar market. Yeah, you got to I asked a lot of questions of our of our guy and I think they were kind of annoyed with me but like they have a lien on the solar system until you pay it off. It's, so yeah. you don't actually yeah. truly own it until you until you pay it off. But one thing we're going to do with with the crypto nexus is take some extra capital, put it into cryptocurrency and then give ourselves a DeFi loan, use the DeFi loan to pay down the solar loan and then slowly pay back the DeFi loan with little to no interest at all it's a cool thing crypto enables us to do now and it's something everyone should be conscious of like if you got a stack of loans which one has the highest interest rate pay that one down first i think it's called the snowball effect or something like that yeah it's ramsey's thing yeah good old dave ramsey this is the dave ramsey show yeah <laughs> awesome to awesome to pay down debt and any of his financial advice about how to invest He's not doing any of that shit. He probably has no idea what he's invested in. He's a little conservative for my liking when it comes to making money. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I got to pick your brain. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Nicole. No, I was okay. going to say, John Bush, I, I, I love, I, I think in our, free, not freedom minded, but maybe on the, the more, some of us that come from the, the right wing end of things where we started up, some people aren't super excited about electric vehicles. I'm not sure why. I love them. But there does seem to be a, a bit of a, a, a some people that just hate it. You know, I, I come from oil country and I, I can't wait to get an electric um, Ram. 50. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, John. I can't drive an electric vehicle. I literally drive every Saturday and Sunday more than the range of the vehicle. 100 percent. And you're you're one of the ones and that's OK. And I mean, I just 
like, don't get me wrong. We just drove a thousand kilometers, sorry, uh, 700 miles the other day in a day, right? That's mm -hmm. tough. But also, I also, you know, I do like five hour round trips to do my inspections and things. 95% of my driving I could do with an electric Ram, no problem at all. And I could charge it up at home. And I love, I, I've been thinking about this, John, and maybe even touch on a little bit, the concept of uh, using your electric vehicle as emergency power storage as well. Have you, I reached out to a lady on Twitter who wrote an entire five part article. She was going to come on the show and then she backed out. And anyway, I just, I love that whole concept of, you know, solar might be a good long-term option for some people because, you know, you can store only so much gas, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, know. it's good. I, yeah, it's it's good for redundancy. So we have the privilege of having a solar system that can power our car, which is super groovy. So if there's gas shortages, or the prices get ridiculous, or even if the electricity goes out at the gas stations, right, we'll still be able to, to use our little Tesla Model 3. I mean, we're not going to be able to haul anything or go drive through a flood or anything, but um, it has 320 uh, miles, which is the range. So it's pretty great for city, for small trips. And then I'm actually pretty impressed with the the power wall or the Tesla uh, supercharger network. And then besides mm. the supercharger, which is exclusive to Tesla's right now, there's all sorts of smaller companies that have set up these charger networks. And so if you're doing a trip between cities, chances are there's going to be a destination charger or a supercharger. And so you pull up these chargers, it costs little to nothing. Like the equivalent of filling a tank would cost like seven or eight dollars in, in yeah. electricity. And it takes like 20, 30 minutes to get the full range uh, powered up. So it's still, you know, it's still in its infancy. But at the same time, for most routes all across the U.S., they have these these spots where you can stop and, and do the supercharger thing, which I think is pretty cool. And I've looked into the using the Tesla battery as an extra battery backup. Uh, Representative Thomas Massey actually has his whole house powered on a Frankenstein Tesla battery from a car, which I, he's a pretty cool dude in all sorts of respects. But um, it would definitely avoid the warranty if we were to do that now. It's not like an official Elon approved kind of deal, but it could be done for sure if you basically hooked up like a DC AC converter or something, you would be able to do that in an emergency situation. I hope one day they allow that as an actual thing with through the software updates and stuff that would be pretty groovy but if nothing I'm, else you could still use that cigarette lighter and an inverter and some extension cords and yes yeah. things yeah for sure yeah i love it i mean i think the biggest the the biggest game changer for me besides not having to go to the gas station ever which is a nice in and of itself is the car has a one speed transmission so you put your foot on the accelerator and it just gets up and goes really fast. Like it goes zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. So just the driving experience from that alone is very unique and it enables you, like you got a lot of extra pickup even when you're already going 60 on a highway. So it's just something like it's, if folks are considering it, I would go do a test drive. It was my fiance that actually wanted the Tesla. And I was like, ah, whatever. They're, they're kind of expensive, electric car. I don't know. And then we test drove one and I was like, oh my God, that was the funnest thing I've done. It's like a freaking roller coaster. So it's a cool experience. And I think it's, you know, sooner and later, unfortunately, they're probably going to outlaw internal combustion engine, which I certainly don't appreciate. Um, but our, our AM2, we did have a big old uh, Ford uh, or a big Dodge Ram, like V8, uh, it was kind of jacked up and my fiance drove it. So it wasn't very practical. It's like a homestead truck. If we're lifting heavy <laughs> stuff, we got an extra foot to go. But uh, we want to get like an old beater, maybe diesel truck, ideally an older one before all the chips and all, you know, some, maybe that's something that could withstand an EMP if crap were to hit the fan. But it's good. If someone has an electric car, definitely don't go all electric. And on, on the other hand, we, it actually helps with some survival and preparedness to have gas and electric. Yeah, this is the comment we got from Tactical Redneck was there's a reason train locomotives are diesel electric. So they're running diesel to convert to electric because of efficiency. Yes. Just because you have an electric vehicle doesn't mean you can't burn gas to run it, I guess. You could recharge it with your generator. Generator, yeah. Don't know. Electric cars are I'm not my bailiwick because like John Willis, I have to drive far. Although I've been window shopping 
for an electric scooter or something <laughs> that I can use just in the hauler. That's a start. You know, like a, the Vespas look kind of sexy. There's and then cool, I'm like, do I need a golf uh, cart so I can take people for a ride? Or do I just need to get a cool <laughs> sidecar? I don't know. There's a cool utility bike, electric utility bike. that uh, has racks on the front and the back. You can put baskets and carts and stuff on it. Panniers, all kinds. I'll send you a link to them, Nicole. They're, they're pretty cool. But when you start looking at electric bicycles, they cost as much as motorcycles. Like people, yeah. like you can buy a $2,000 e-bike, but it is not – it's like buying a Walmart bicycle. Most of those mm -hmm. things yeah. are in the range of about $6,000. Like specialized, my mountain bike, Trek. Um, those are nine thousand dollar mountain bikes that are electric. So the cost, and then the and then the cost in like I keep saying today's money, everything costs more. Um, that's just the cost, you know. Everything is up from what it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, and the reason Did you ever look at those, John, Sorry. is I've maintained my motorcycle before, and I've maintained, um, and I find it difficult to do like i find that my stuff breaks more that's gas run than than battery operated and so i've been looking at a battery solution for the tootling around because i don't want to be messing with the carburetor basically so i agree with you 100 percent for different reasons like i i think the electric bicycle is awesome it's quiet we can charge yeah. it off solar um so the aspect of it yeah it's i'm, I'm not i'm not dissuading at all from yeah. it. I think it's a great idea um me with an electric car when we leave this property and we drive 200, 300 yeah. miles every weekend, my plan is for something catastrophic to happen. So if I have to plug my car in and have it smart charged for however long, I, I, have, I have no concept of how long that takes on a, on a fast charge for a Tesla. But in my truck, in two and a half minutes, I can dump five and a half gallons of fuel, which is on board the truck, plus an additional 20 gallons of fuel. I mean, when we, when we built trucks last year, year before, when we, when we put the trucks together, we put big bumpers on them and things with the thought that if things were bad in town, we could push shit out of the way. We could drive through the corner of a building. We could go over signs, whatever we had to do. Checkpoints. Car, work, car doesn't work for me. World Sounds Economic like Forum checkpoints. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is a problem. Okay, here's, a, here's an interesting question from the comments. Um, from somebody at work, we were talking about how I prep. He's late in the game and he asked me what first thing I should buy, which is often the first question you get from somebody who has just woken up and realized, well, crap, stuff isn't like I thought it was. This centralized supply chain system appears to be unable to handle disruption. Now what do I do? What would what would y'all say? You can each have a go at this one. Uh, I, I would say start with the free shit, water. Fill as many containers as you yeah. can with water. Hey, was that was that a W, John, by chance, or was that yeah, a three? Three, three okay, seconds, so, yeah. three minutes, three hours, three days. Yes. Threes. Yes. Yeah. And don't yeah. get don't get overwhelmed. My, I recorded five episodes before I left that are running this the next few days, and they're all fifteen minute episodes on getting started the bare basics. Like I'm scared shitless. Where do I start? And I think I I set people up with like I was going to say it's like three hundred dollars, and you've got food, water, and inverter to run off your car. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, a decent little first aid kit. That's it, right? I mean, don't don't get overwhelmed because a lot of people do. Buy your calories, grow your protein. Are you someplace mm. where you could even survive if something catastrophic happened? Um, water, I like to say water's free. While it comes out of the faucet, it's pretty much free, just like, just like he said. Um, some way to defend that, possibly. If things are bad enough to where you're going to have to actually eat those stores, you're probably going to have people thinking about taking them as well. Um, the only thing that keeps civilization civilized is the fear of repercussion from law enforcement and court, right? I believe, I truly believe that over half of the population doesn't commit crime against you or somebody else simply because of the, the false idea that it's held together very loosely, right? So look at all the things going on around, just in the United States even right now, how amplified it is over the last couple of years. And if, if your wife was out at the grocery store going to get groceries and things were just slightly different, would somebody try to grab her up? Is that a possibility? Would you like her to be able to defend herself in some manner? John, uh, I would say, well, for one, I would encourage them to join the Freedom Cell Network so they can find a bunch of like-minded people <laughs> yes. that could help them as they transition. 
And I can imagine like waking up nowadays, it seems like, like I quote unquote woke up after 9-11 and it was like the genesis of this police surveillance state that was expanding after 9-11 with the Patriot Act and all that stuff and the NSA expanding and Department of Homeland Security. But now after the COVID tyranny and like what we're facing now, it must be extremely overwhelming. And if you can skip that, that stage of overwhelm, freak out, stress out, annoy the piss out of your friends and your family by trying to <laughs> shove it down their throat. If you can just skip that and go straight to solutions and proactive proactivity and doing stuff, I think that would be really good for people's psyche. So I would say to find people that are close to you that you can network with. And if they already know how to garden, if they're already advanced when it comes to preparedness, then learn from them. And of course, food and water, like y'all were saying, the water is, tends to be an easy one. You can even start recycling some of your jugs and stuff. Just make sure you cycle through them because they kind of leach after a while. And then when it comes to food, I, I've i always encouraged people, every time you go to the grocery store, just add a good 10 or 20% in storable foods uh, and uh, foods with longer shelf lives. And then it doesn't break the bank. It's really simple. And you know, over the course of two, three, four months, you'll find that you have a good stash that could get you through a couple, two or three months. Yeah, whenever somebody asks me that question, what should I buy? I, I like to tell them they're asking the wrong question. I, it, I like to acknowledge the fear. Like, I understand that it's scary to watch this, but if your first question is, what can I buy? And you haven't assessed what your goals are and what you need. That's the wrong question. I, I shouldn't be telling you what to buy. You should be looking at your life and figuring out what, what, what am I already prepared for? Cause a lot of people are prepared for more than they realize they've already gone through that winter where the flu hit all of them at once. And so now they keep some Theraflu on hand just out of, as a matter of course. So you don't have to have the miserable experience of driving to the store with the flu. You'll be surprised how much you already have. And then how is your defense, your food, your water, your medical supplies, your energy stores? What are you going to do for shelter? Think about all those things that you would need if something happened. And then you can start chipping away at it. And then maybe it's time to think about what are you going to buy? Do you need to develop a deep pantry? Do you need to, to start a fuel rotation system? Do you need to, I mean, as, as everybody said, water is free. You can start storing water and be done with that tomorrow. Um, I think it's a horrible mistake to listen to preppers on the internet who give you a list of what you have to have because that list is their list or it's a list that somebody else has given them that may or may not serve you well. If you don't know how to cook dry beans, don't buy beans and rice and put them in a bucket. Not going to help you. If you can't eat beans, don't do that. If you store beans wrong and too long, they'll never cook. And if you eat undercooked beans, you're going to have a long day on the toilet. A week's worth. Yeah. And <laughs> speaking of the toilet, what are you going to do if your water stops running and you need to flush? A lot of people living in, in city, uh, in buildings and stuff, don't realize too, when the power goes out, a lot of times the sewage will come up in through into your bathroom. Like that happens also when those digester pumps fail. Yeah. There's a lot of buildings. There was buildings up apartments that were underground in New York buildings that actually flooded and killed people when the power went out in New York just a couple of years ago, maybe even one year ago. Um, and they had a, two levels of apartments underground level and it flooded up when those, when, when the power went out. So one thing I've been thinking, good one, learn to cook without a stove or oven, learn to cook over fire. a fire. If you have yeah. a bunch of food, but no power or gas, how are you going to cook the food or boil water? Great questions. Anybody who loves camping has already solved this. And I can't believe it. Somebody who listens to my podcast went online. It was like, my power's out. I miss coffee. And I was like, oh. how oh. about a paper towel, your canning funnel and your camping stove? And she's like, Oh, I have a pour over cone. I just didn't want to fire up the outside burner on my grill. I'm like, dude, you've got a propane grade like burner right outside your front uh, door. Go make yourself some coffee. Coffee's yeah. critical. A lot of stuff oh, goes yes. before the caffeine goes. <laughs> I'm a piece of crap in the morning without my caffeine. It's not that's not good in a situation if you're out of coffee or some or you can't have access to caffeine just for some, something to be aware of too for folks that are so is it caffeine is it caffeine for you john or is it um the actual act of drinking coffee 
it's the caffeine. I mean, I enjoy the taste and the drinking of the coffee as well. I enjoy the taste of this a little bit too much also. Me and my, me and my fiance both, we're like, especially her, she's like just totally dense in the morning until she has <laughs> one to two cups. And so, you know, back to the question and how Nicole pointed out, like it's not about what you buy. I think mindset really has a lot to do with it. Uh, not freaking out, believing in yourself, and one of the biggest differentiators between success and folks that wallow or freak out or just don't make it in, in all sorts of areas of life, I think it's like a self-confidence. So it's always important while things are still relatively chill now, although it's getting worse and worse all the time, to develop that self-confidence and to learn those skills and to go out and show yourself that you can start the fire in the backyard or that you know how to do whatever, even like do a test run. Like with our power walls, you can turn off the grid, which is pretty cool. So you can kind of see like, all right, let's see through our normal day-to-day -day life, how many days can we last just going with the sun and the batteries? And so it's good to kind of do those tests. Camping is a great opportunity for a family to go out and, and test out some of their gear and stuff too. I think that every family should throw that circuit breaker for a weekend yep. in house camp and, and use no power and see where you really are at what you're ready for and all those supplies you have that don't matter in that situation, right? In that immediate first, and it doesn't have to be 72 hours. Do it just for just 24 hours and see what happens with it. Yeah, Make be it telling. fun. Toast some marshmallows outside. And a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people, they, they want to be prepared by buying things, right? Those are, you know, prep tenders or, or collectors. I call them collectors, not preppers. Um, if you're out of shape, and you truly believe that civilization is getting different and things are going to be harder and you might have to actually use a shovel, How? It, why not put a little bit of time into your fitness? It doesn't matter what level of fitness you're at, Three. but it's going to change your mind. Like You can take a man and put him in prison. You can put him on a ship for six months. No matter what you do, you cannot keep him from remaining somewhat physically fit. And it releases endorphins and it changes your entire mindset when you have movement. So if you truly believe and you're about to pull your $100,000 out of the bank or cash in your 401k and buy these things, if you're convinced enough to do that, can you not be convinced enough to put 30 minutes into physical fitness a day until you can do an hour? Build some calluses up on your hands. You're in for a rude awakening <laughs> if you think you're going to have to, like when, when gasoline runs out, you're going to move some things with a cart or a wheelbarrow. You're going to dig holes with a shovel. Those power tools might not work like they do right now right you might have to actually do things by hand pick some pick up an axe and just cut some wood start with that i mean it, it's i and i do those things and when i walk in amanda's like what's wrong with you i'm like oh, i cut some wood today and i don't have shit to show for it i mean there's a little pile it's just <laughs> things that it's we're cathartic. not used to doing get some aggression yeah. out and it's i want to i want to encourage people to like i uh, i do consultations and um, a lot of people, I notice a theme, the consultation starts off and they are com like completely freaked out thinking that mm -hmm. crap's going to hit the fan tomorrow or the central bank digital currencies are going to be switched on and there's going to be an economic reset and they're not going to have access to any of the money in their bank. And I want people to kind of recognize that in my view, and this is after 20 years of studying this stuff and then like being ready for crap to hit the fan since 2006 we thought it was always right there it's, it's going to happen any day now it's going to happen any day and we had a big economic crisis but it wasn't like a mad max style collapse scenario so in my view i think what's more likely to happen on a big scale like big picture collapse or change is like a slow gradual transition into this new great reset technocratic paradigm. It's not going to be like a flip of the switch. It's not going to be a total economic or societal collapse. It's going to be a slow, gradual transition in a way that a lot of people beg for those changes. And so that's just my analysis of it all. But I want folks to like, don't do anything hasty because you think it's all going to come crashing yeah. down next week or next month. Make sure you're still taking care of your fundamentals and you're still protecting what it is that you have built or created, right? Like if folks have 401ks or IRAs or whatever, some people are like, I need to pull it out right away. I don't care about the penalty or whatever. I need to put it all into gold or all into crypto or whatever. It's still good to have one foot in the old school game and then one foot in the, you know, prepper uh, crypto gold kind of world. 
and I don't think crap's really going to hit the fan extreme like we thought it was. Now, of course, you have weather problems. You have little things that flare up here and there. But as far as like a big, the big collapse that everyone's always dreaming of, I, I don't know. I think it's, I, I don't think it's going to be more of a different style transition. I hope you're right. I, I grew up in an evangelical household. And whenever people talk about that mindset, John, it reminds me of the end of the world folks that I used to know, you know, and, and there was always, there was always a prophet that was always like, you know, I, there's some kind of verse in the Bible. I can't remember basically along the lines of, you know, they'll be predicting the end of times for, I mean, they've been predicting the end of times since, you know, at least back to zero. Right. So we're talking 2000 years and I've been a prepper since Y2K and it's just one of those things. Uh, fear is a really good short-term motivator, but it's a really piss poor long-term motivator. So a lot of times it brings people, whether it's, you know, whether somebody's seeking solace in religion or seeking solace in preparedness, you know, you want to do everything, but then when whatever it is you're scared of doesn't happen immediately, all of a sudden you lose motivation and you drop out, right? Whereas, I, like you said, surrounding yourself with good people and realizing, okay, yes, I'm scared, but, you know, <laughs> pick whatever XYZ issue it is. It was COVID two months ago. It's Ukraine, Russia today. It'll be something different again. And we deal with that shit all the time. You might be scared of it now, but use that to get you prepared so you feel more confident and not, okay, that passed. Like so many preppers come into pre prepping in Y2K and then drop it all afterwards because they're like, well, see, shit didn't happen, right? Use it as a starting point, but don't don't have that as your only, your only bit. Try to slide over into long-term realizing the benefits of being prepared all the time. Well, and we saw yeah, that in March 2020, where people suddenly became aware that they have to store consumables. Paper. <laughs> right, consumables of different kinds. And, you know, that was a real big eye opener for people when they saw empty shelves. They'd never seen that before in their life, except for temporarily after a tornado or a hurricane, right? And so they started storing up and there's this great renaissance of making bread from scratch and all of this cool stuff going on. And you fast forward to 2022 and our own government and corporate media sources are saying food shortages are coming, which might if mean they're, they're coming. <laughs> if they're saying it, you're like, boy, um, you know, there's some things we see that could lead to that. And then it's it's not that I trust the government. It's that they know they're screwed if they don't say it now uh, when it happens. And there are a lot of reasons why we're moving that direction. Um, and people who were so renaissance prepared in 2020 are back to what do I buy? Well, why don't you have a deep pantry at this point? Okay, so this time, are you going to learn the lesson? Because if you're preparing for what's likely to happen, most likely to happen, when the bad stuff, like the really bad stuff, like civil war breaks out or something really catastrophic happens, you've got what you need anyway, but you didn't do it in a way that sacrificed long-term flexibility for surviving in this world right now. I, I know somebody who lost everything in around 2008 in response to thinking the the economy was going to reset because obama got elected and they sold everything moved to the country and waited for an economic collapse that didn't happen and four years in didn't have a, pit, a pot to piss in and had to start all over so there is there's I think there's a reasonable way to, to prepare for things. And then there is like, if, if you do sell everything you own right now and make a quick change, what happens if it doesn't collapse? Are you making right. the kind of change that is also positive hmm. for if it doesn't collapse? Because yeah. it, if you do sacrifice everything and then it doesn't collapse and you're planning to live on hunting deer, then you have a problem. If it does collapse and you're planning to live on hunting deer, by the way, you have a problem. If you look at what happened during the Civil War here, yeah. turkeys almost went extinct and there was no game. There was no game because hungry people going to hunt whether or not there's a hunting rule. You can see that happening all around here and, and your place probably as well, Nicole. I mean, there's hundreds of new driveways out here. 
and they can't yeah. they can't contractors can't even start for three years right now and if you look at all the all the local facebook groups it's hey how come we don't have a movie theater how come we don't oh. have a grocery store well yeah you, you move someplace without a movie theater like, <laughs> You should probably, if you think that we need a movie theater, you should start a movie theater. Ah, a drive-in. Okay. Those aren't everybody too, wants, too much everybody overhead. Everybody wants to vote with somebody else's money, but they don't have any of their own money to, to do what they're voting for. I grew up in a town like that. It was on the very end of the East Coast in Nova Scotia. And people would retire there from like Ontario and Quebec. And they wouldn't do a single bit of research, but they'd buy a property right at the very end on the second island. And all they would do is come to town and constantly bitch. There's nothing down there. There's nothing here. And I'm like, didn't you fucking come that's and look for five <laughs> yeah. minutes? Like, that's why we like it here. Piss that's off and leave. Point. Not in my backyard. Yep. Oh, I, yeah. I'm in Florida right now. Everywhere. Like, I know Florida's always been one of those places. I have met more people right from the lady that rented us the car. Well, that was in Nashville, sorry. But she, she'd come down from the Bronx. All these people coming from your traditional you know, your New York's and your California's and your Washington's everywhere. They're all in Tennessee. Every time I talked to somebody, it was the same thing. They were from away everywhere. I know Florida was traditionally that way a bit, but you'd ask them when they moved here. Oh, we just, you know, everywhere has hired new people that have moved here just recently. It, it blows me away. Yeah. And here's a comment. Nothing wrong with being scared. It's an, a real emotion and a motivator. I don't think we're dissing on being scared. No, I think all. if you make all of your decisions from a fear perspective, you end up unsuccessful, though. If you, you stay, have to feel it, let it go and make the right decision. If you operate yes. constantly in fight or flight with extreme fear, that cortisol is going to eat you up. You're going yeah. to end up with you cannot Answer. be healthy in that manner. Use, I use fear to motivate or I use, you know, finance, whatever it is to get going. But once I'm going, it's momentum and it's no longer fear. Yeah. And I, I like find it. when I'm afraid of what I see going on, which happens, even though I'm a voice of reason in that field. Okay. I go talk to friends and I'm like, okay, I'm in a bad headspace. I'm feeling fear. I need to let it go, but I need to acknowledge it first. Can you talk to me? Like, let's just, because I'm a verbalizer. That's why I have a podcast. So can you talk to me so I can find the reasonable way to put this on a shelf where it belongs and, and get through it. And so I can make the right decision instead of scream. You look at the last <laughs> two years, you know, of all the COVID mania or whatever. I mean, so many people, you, you just can't hold that fear over somebody for that long and, and get the behavior you're looking for. You know, some people will be longer, some people will be shorter. That, like you said, that fight or flight will eat you alive if you live in it too long. It'll turn you into a nasty person and an unmotivated person eventually. So you just give up because you feel like I can't do anything because I'm just scared all the time. But it's yeah. a great motivator to get you up off your ass and get you started. But you got to find a better headspace after that. Do you think that's maybe the plan with the media, the constant bombardment of everything negative to finally break most if people you can, in the population? 100%. Because if you... The, the only way that you can make fear a good long-term motivator is to change the source of fear, right? So, like, I mean, go back to 1984, George Orwell, they did it all the time. You know, the, the fear was the same, but the enemy was different, right? And that's, you know, without sounding like a crazy person, it feels like that's what's happening because there's always that new, that new thing, like, oh, a new variant. And, well, that's not working anymore. Let's, uh, try, yeah, to... let's try Ukraine and Russia now. And, you know, well, yeah, always... absolutely, John. They always telegraph the punch, you know, event 201 before the COVID thing happened, yet it was exactly how the COVID thing happened. Now you've got Klaus Schwab, the, the greatest threat to the world is a cyber attack. And now you see all these things <laughs> telling you all this stuff is cyber attack. And you're being told in media that all these food processing plants being burnt down are cyber attack because of Ukraine. But when you look at them, you had them happening months before Ukraine. Yeah. So this year... And when you try to go back beyond two years, you can't find any information about it. It's like it's just been wiped. And keep in mind, too, when we rely on, on this, right, for our history books and our reference books, it's a digital book burning. They don't have to burn the books. They don't have to pull all the librarians out and bring all the books. They don't have to light a fire. They just simply remove it from your access now. So the point I was listening, I was talking to some guys this morning, and they said that they can't find any reference material beyond – 18 months as to how many factories and how many food production places actually have catastrophic failures and burn downs in the United States. But in the last 90 days, we've had like 27 
and two yeah. of them have been airplane strikes. Wow. That blew me away a little bit. I Because I, I'm on a lot of the back channel stuff with the Prepper Broadcast Network guys, mm -hmm. and they'll be sharing stories. And I, like, yeah, sometimes you, you almost, you read the story, you're like, there's no way that's friggin' true. But I'm telling you, this guy's, I started digging, and I'm like, holy shit, that's crazy. How many uh, meat and food processing plants had either had accidental fires or planes landing in them? And I was like, that, that kind of, that's a little uh, unnerving for sure. Ireland just had their biggest uh, egg production facility burned 100% to the ground and kill all of their egg laying chickens in there. Now I know they I know they have more, but that's the biggest facility. Yikes. Right. Yikes. Hey, I got to run, gang, but I wanted to invite your audience, Nicole, to join us in Bastrop, Texas for the Exxon Build Land Summit. Uh, Nicole will be presenting, super excited uh, that she'll be there. Jack Spierko as well, uh, Joel Salatin, Marjorie Wildcraft, all sorts of cool people. And I'm hoping as many people can still join us in person as possible because that's what's really going to be special. We're going to visit some farms, and some food production systems and... Uh, there's a food forest in Bastrop we're going to check out. It's going to be a nice buzz in the room, but if folks can't join us in person, people can watch day one and two completely for free online. You just have to register at exitandbuildlandsummit.com, exitandbuildlandsummit.com. Oh, and then on Sunday, Nicole, myself, and Jack are going to be doing like a roundtable all about entrepreneurship as a vehicle for being able to purchase land. Yep. A lot, I think that's one of a lot of people's biggest obstacles is they're like, well, I don't have the money to do it. But then they stop there. They're like, well, I don't have money to afford a down payment or to buy land. Therefore, I give up. Whereas like if you're solutions oriented, you're like, OK, well, I don't have money now, but how can I get money? Uh, we're going to talk about how entrepreneurship has worked for us in our own lives. Sunday is all about immersive, in-depth workshops. Joel Skousen of Strategic Relocation is going to do an hour and 15 minute workshop where he's going to take everyone's questions about specific locations and ideas and stuff. So it's going to be a really special event. It will be recorded too for folks that can't make it. We have an immersion pass where you get all the replays and stuff. Nicole was a great hit at the first one. She was on point there. I was, I was blown away. She, she really dominated. What, so tell us what you're going to talk about for this one, Nicole. I'm going to go more deeply into underground networks and how that relates to commerce and entrepreneurship to set yourself up uh, for a network you can depend on when the commercial network that we are depending on fails. And then how that can be leveraged into finding land. I, at that round table we're doing, I have some pretty good stories about acquiring property with no money. Mm, I love it. Acquiring property with no money. Um, no money is not, not a reasonable excuse. That tells me no, no motivation if you stop there. Yep. And uh, the whole purpose of Exit and Build Land, Land Summit is one I love because John realized, hey, it's hard to be free in a city with HOAs and all this other crap going on there. If they want to get you dependent on them, and we've seen this in Shanghai when they shut down the whole city because of COVID, right? They can starve you in the city. Still are. Mm. If they lock yeah. you down, they can starve you in the city, and you are now dependent on on the people who have you locked down and have the exits closed off. Uh, it's harder to do that in the country because it's harder to shut us down out here, and it's a lot easier, I think, to choose freedom and to live the way you want to live when you are somewhere without a lot of regulations, people not all up in your face. We had a guy get out of jail here. Jail broke. Actually, I think he chain gang broke. And they had, you know, they were looking for him and he ran off into the woods and the officials were like, yeah, we'll wait till the snakes and the ticks and the chiggers chase him out. We're not going up there. It doesn't mean they can't get you there. It doesn't mean it's impossible. It is just harder. Yep. Heck are yeah. You, are you coming to Tennessee, John? I, I very well might. So, well, you're on uh, the agenda, so you better, very, very well better. Oh, well, dang. I guess it just happened for sure. What, that, let's go. Um, yeah. Our plan is to buy a motor home and drive up to New Hampshire for the Porcupine Freedom Festival. And then I saw that Nicole was doing that event with some others there. So I thought oh, that would be great. Festival at John Willis's. Right on. I thought it'd be a great opportunity to to go check out what you guys are doing because I'm super impressed with the community that y'all have up there. Plus the, uh, what's it called? There's a intentional community. That's part of our whole thing. Um, 
that's like what uh, what I see is like the ultimate, right? Like homesteading, preparedness on our own level with our family. But like, imagine bringing together eight, 12, 16 families and we're all on the same property. And essentially we were like building our own little mini civilization. And then we link up with the other folks that are doing that same thing. And with the folks that have their own solo property. And we create like this decentralized network of mutual defense, trade, support. This guy's got the eggs. This guy lets us borrow the tractor or whatever. Um, but there's a there's an intentional community in Tennessee uh, that's built around midwives, right? What's it called? The farm. The farm, yes. Yeah. So oh, there are a lot to, of intentional communities. Go in check this. that out. Yeah. 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 Or the well, Holly hey, Neighbors. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We, we, well, we're on the, we're going to make it happen then. We're on the agenda, so it's going down. Yep. That's cool. selfrelianceFestival.com. If you haven't gotten your tickets, guys, they're selling out fast. So I recommend doing that. Go check out Exit and Build Land Summit as well. If you're going to be around Bastrop, Texas, it's going to be a good time. Not cool. a bad time of year to be there. It'll be a little toasty, but not too bad. We'll What's be right. behind you there, John? Oh, this is a painting by a guy named, ah, oh, shoot. Let me see. New Pioneers. His name is Brian something. And it's basically... I love it. We have it in our in our living room as well. It uh, it kind of just portrays some pioneers here, and they have a path. They can go down the path of destruction, and there's like jets in the sky, and there's all sorts of military and death and chaos, or they can go down this path where there's like beautiful uh, farming going on in the hills, and there's this really sweet like uh, in the corner you can't see it, but there's this beautiful like sustainable building that has all sorts of meeting spaces these guys are eating dinner over here so so it's dig cool. it man with you in the middle I, th I think atlas shrugged i see just the wrecked yeah. cities and then i see where they escaped to over here that's right yep yeah it's called new pioneers cool cool all right well thanks for having me nicole yep see nice you soon. with you guys see you here john all the events <laughs> <laughs> Yes. There's an event every month all year. So, I got it. Yeah. So you need to charge more for the events. Yeah. You well, we charge, can. Like you, your, for you to show up to talk should cost more. And the event should cost more. I mean, until you have that medium right there. That's the way that works over time, isn't it? Well, Dan Pena, if you don't know who he is, you should. everybody should look him up and just watch, pick anything from him and just watch it. He has a castle in Scotland. He was from... Long Beach, California. And he used to do these, you know, how to be successful conferences and stuff. And he would feel bad for people and give them free, you know, let them come for free. And what he found was his, his success rate was about 25%. When he raised his price to $25,000, it's now 25 grand. His success rate is 100%. And he yep. still fills his classes. It's because they have a vested interest. The people that can beg, borrow, steal, come up with that $25,000, they've already came up with the $25,000 to do it. The dude's making tons of money that can easily afford it. They don't need it. So he hits that that perfect medium right in there. It's like yeah. trying to give something away for free on social media, right, Nicole? Oh, no. I mean, geez. I gave away I gave away railroad ties two weeks ago. It's the worst decision I've ever made. I just wanted them gone. Them. And yeah, you... I should have priced those things. I mean, the person who did show up was perfectly delightful but the number of questions i got asked about railroad ties and then my response was like fuck off it's you know free. i didn't quite say it that way but it was you know i no i'm not going to go measure each one and give you a video <laughs> tour of the pile of railroad ties i've described what they were used for what condition they're in that there's rebar sticking out of them that you're gonna have to cut off if you want them like there was work involved in getting these. And I was to the point where I was just going to go out there with the grinder and cut that rebar myself and then sell them when somebody actually showed up with their own grinder and they cut the rebar and took them. But it was hilarious how, how hard that, in fact, I had a piece of melamine yesterday that I wanted to get rid of. Those things are 45 bucks at Lowe's right now. It had four screw holes from being hung on my wall as a dry erase board. I posted it up for 10 bucks. Yep. Nobody bit in half a day. I went out and I jumped up and down on it till it was in tiny little pieces and it went to the dumpster because I was like, I, I need it gone and I'm not going to give it away for free because that'll take too long. If we put it out for free, you got to ask a bunch of, there's a bunch of questions. If I put it out at the end of the driveway for $10, somebody will steal it and it'll be gone. 
Maybe your yep. driveway, not mine. <laughs> but that's, that's why we keep shipping containers. Like I don't deal, we won't deal with people. We'll just put it in the shipping container until we need it or we repurpose it five years for something else. Yeah. I got two sea can shipping containers and I fill them full, but uh, about twice a year, I got to go through them because we, like I said, we, we clean out repo houses yeah. and I, I used to be very non-discriminatory on what I kept. I've gotten a lot more discriminatory, but if it has value, especially in building supplies, that comes home with me every time. Like things like three foot section of two by twelves, you know, I, I use them for shelves or like I, I just, uh, we just stripped the basement of an entire house that had a little bit of mold in it. And I saved all the shelves out of the closets because they were three quarter inch plywood. And even a two foot by four foot section of that right now is worth like $25. Yeah. I hope John's right. And civilization doesn't collapse. On the other hand, I'm never going to be upset that I have all this stuff if we Amen. ever need it for anything. We've got enough property. I've got, I've got three shipping containers out here, and we're constantly doing shelves and stuff. Like I tell my guys when they come in and do any work, I'm like, nothing beyond, nothing under, if it's over six inches of wood, it always gets kept. We will use it someplace, whether we're making 45s to, you know, to hang shelves or whatever. If it's over six inches, that, stay, that stays here, right? Because we bought it. We paid for it. We can't take that little cut back and they all add up. Yeah. Well, and you, you have a situation too, where people are constantly through there Yeah. and visiting your factory. And how many times does somebody show up and need something? And you're like, yeah, I got that here all the time. Yeah. yeah like time. every time I'm there, that happens. That's happened to people me. People call once. me all the time. You know, my brother-in-law, he'll be hanging like a while back. He was hanging a garage door opener. He says, do you have any, uh, that slot wall, you know, punch, punch angle iron, you know? Yeah. I had six chunks, four feet long sitting in the corner in my garage. And my garage isn't cluttered, but I have spots for all that stuff. Anything that is like a base material that I can use, I call them zero jobs. So like the other day I had to fix a, uh, um, a fence, you know, a fence gate for my daughter. And she could have got her landlord to go do it, but I said, I'll just go do it. And I dug around and I had three old hinges that I'd saved in a bucket. I had a lock that was brand new in the pack. And I took a couple of boards that I had off cuts of and I fixed it for her for nothing. I love it. Like if you, yeah, that's, I, I, I preach preparedness all the time. And if you can keep that kind of stuff on hand to be self-sufficient for home repairs, you're ahead of most people. Yeah. I don't know that I'm there yet, but I, I strive to be there one step at a I'm, time. I still need my bug sucking up to. tool that John Willis has one of. You need what? I need one of those vacuums. That's oh, like you'll love it. on my list. Yeah. You'll love it. I'm going to, I'll go, I'll, I will cackle while, while vacuuming bugs. It will be yeah. so fun for me. Particularly the hornet that's over here right now. <laughs> we suck them up. We've got, you know, red wasps in the building every day because yeah. the, the doors are open and closed so often. We just suck them up with it. Yeah. Sucks it right in. Cool. Well, Toolman Tim, promo your stuff. Let's let's maybe wrap up. We're not getting a lot of questions anymore. That's okay. No worries. Yeah, this is awesome. Thanks for having me on. Uh, like I said, I guess the, the easiest way seems to be the, the most popular way to find me lately has been the uh, the workshop podcast everywhere all the podcast feeds that thing's growing i love it i got 45 45 degree growth on it and that's because i got an awesome community so i i appreciate people for that uh if you want to you know i actually got a couple of chances to see me live and chatting well i guess lftn spring workshop if tickets are all sold for that so sold if you're going to be there you'll yep but <laughs> if you've ever gone to prepper camp i'm going to be in north carolina in september and i'm going to be doing uh, uh a, an hour presentation on preparedness three days in a row there so Wait, what day in september to, is that Ah, uh, shit. I want to say it's the second weekend in September. Okay. Um, I can, yeah, for sure. But apparently it's the largest outdoor prepper um, expo slash get together. I don't know exactly, but it's, uh, I made a lot of connections there with Rick Austin through the PBN guys. And so I'm going to be there speaking. I'm really excited about that. And yeah. Um, and check out uh, toolmantim.co. That's the easiest way to find everything there is to know. Toolmantim.co. And he, um, he will be speaking at my event this week which will be fun yeah. and if you did not get your ticket this year they usually go on sale in january it's the last weekend of april every year we sell out super fast and i've been advocating he just doesn't know it i've been kind of advocating or, or working under the scenes to try to get him excited to come speak at self-reliance festival too so hopefully oh, we'll get you one of those <laughs> At least just, I can get out of the country now legally. Yeah, I mean, would like, he, was, he was supposed to be here last year, and he's like, well, Canada won't let me leave, and the United States won't let me in, so... 
Here Let's, we are. Yeah. John, you want to promote your stuff? So somebody asked about torching weeds. I torch the weeds um, because it burns them up right away. And it also tends to kill the seed. When you chemically spray grass, it dries it out and it dies. Those seeds are still viable. A lot of people don't know that your wheat and your soybeans and stuff, they actually spray that with Roundup right before harvest to dry it out. That's why you have so much Roundup in your body. Um, I will be at Nicole's event Saturday presenting and talking. I have no idea what I'm talking about, so you guys better have some <laughs> conversation so that we can go. Um, and then uh, I do a video. We've been putting out three to four videos every single day on my YouTube channel here. Uh, and then I do a live video every night at nine o'clock where the conversation can be literally anything you guys want to talk about. And we'll go for an hour to two hours, depending how good the conversation is. So, um, easily accessible. If you like the conversations we have, I have that conversation every night at nine o'clock. Yeah. I, you know, if you haven't checked out one of John's nine o'clock lives, definitely do it. One of the things that's really cool about it because he's walking around talking, right? You're like, how could that be entertaining? It is because people are asking him questions, but the part of it that, that really makes it fun if you're winding down at night or something is that the conversations that start happening happen on the video, but then people in his comments talk to each other a lot. You start developing a digital community there in a way that not every live feed does so and i know it's happening here too because some of the same people who are on the nine o'clock live are there you'll see some of the same people there all the time and that is you know we uh, we promote in-person relationships to develop trust but sometimes you start getting to know people digitally first in in the modern world and and that comment chain is a great way to get to know some pretty cool people who are the kind of people you want to know. They're doers, not takers. And and a network of doers is the most important prep you can have, really. And you, in order to have that, you need to be a doer. Well, how many times how many times have you been asked? I know I get it pretty frequently, is how do I find a girlfriend who's on board with these things, right? Well, you gotta go where you like to do things, you should probably meet her at something like that. Yeah. And I say that to say with tactical response and special operations equipment, the self-reliance festival, we have hundreds and hundreds of people that come in here. And every single time that we do one of these, there's somebody that comes from California that literally meets somebody from California that lives 10 minutes, 15 minutes away from them that they yeah. never would have met had they not attended one of the events. That's because they had something common in interest. When you come here, anybody is welcome here. I don't care what you do for a job. We don't care what you look like. We don't care what your religion is. We are here for a common interest. We don't care about any of the other stuff while we're here. So that's how you're going to find people that have the same interests as you. You have to go where they're at. Absolutely. All right. Of course, if you're interested in following me and you don't know who I am, I'm Nicole Sauce from the Living Free in Tennessee podcast. You can check that out. I do a podcast three times a week. And this week is some replay episodes about how to get prepared quickly when supply chains are being disrupted. They're just some replays from 2020 because it's not a different, I don't think it's a different process right now. And it's important to think about. So thanks for joining the live stream. We'll be back next week. Guys, I'll see both of you soon. I'll see you this weekend.